My name is Rebecca Zabarski. I'm the VP of Brand and Strategic Partnerships at Parrot Analytics, and you've joined Parrot Analytics Live, our webinar series. Today, we have a much requested update on representation in Hollywood, led by our Partner Insights Director, Monica trujillo Jamison. Hi, Monica. Hello. Uh, Monica has a really excellent presentation that includes a, a ton of data on talent demand segmented by uh, race, ethnicity, and gender uh, diversity. And it's a really fantastic update on where we're at in entertainment in regards to the faces and the people that we see on screen. Um, and I think that you will really enjoy it. And actually, after Monica's data presentation, we're going to be joined by two Hollywood superstars who have a lot of experience and a strong perspective in the casting world. Uh, the creator and casting director of Hulu's Only Murders in the Building will join us for a live panel conversation for the second half of the webinar. So stick around for that after the presentation and we will get a true Hollywood perspective on casting. Uh, I wanna give a special welcome to our Demand360 Light and Enterprise customers. Thank you for being here. We're thrilled to have you join us. And also thank you to everybody who's Zooming in from all over the world. We know that you might be late where you're coming from. So we, we appreciate your time. Uh, so we're going to get started. I will pass it off to Monica and I'm going to disappear and I'll be in the chat. So if you have any questions for us, you can enter those, share those in our the chat window. Uh, we'll see if we can get to them at the end of the webinar. If not, we'll follow up with you. And again, stick around for the conversation after our presentation. Go ahead, Monica. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Monica Trujillo Jameson. I'll be your host for today's webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so just to, to give you a little bit of background about Parrot and what we do here um, before we get going. At Parrot, we measure uh, the attention economy, which is founded on the principle that time or how and where we dedicate our attention is a finite resource. And this is governed by the economic principles of supply and demand. And in the context of content, which is what we'll, we'll be talking about today, we think of platforms, networks, brands, shows, movies, all of these competing essentially for our time. Our measurement systems capture and identify all the supply that audiences engage with be it uh, TV shows, movies, talent, topics, or brands. And these sources of supply, which you see here on the left-hand side of the slide, um, also include internal genes about a specific show, such as the genre, platform, or original language of the show. And when it comes to talent, these can include age, gender, and country of origin of the talent. We also measure the demand by capturing signals of audience engagement with that content or talent. And these expressions of demand are collected from the sources that you see here on the right hand side of the slide. And they can range from conducting research, peer to peer streaming, social videos, social media. Um, and these two systems of supply and demand will form the backbone for our conversation today and will be used to inform today's webinar. So today's webinar, um, we will be highlighting the trends in representation over the last five years for the most in-demand shows. We're going to look at what these trends reveal about whether gains are being made and whether it's streaming platforms or linear networks that are leading the market's demand for equity in terms of representation. And as Rebecca mentioned, we're also going to take a deep dive into Hulu's Only Murders in the Building, a show that exemplifies some of the trends that we're seeing. And um, in doing so, we're going to highlight some of our talent analytics. We're going to see how you can track talent demand against a show's demand to optimize promotional campaigns, how you can identify which talent are driving uh, conversations before release, and learn how consumer sentiment maps onto key talent ahead of release or throughout a show's run. And just a little bit of context for how this idea came about. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Hollywood Diversity Report, what, which uh, releases almost on a yearly basis. 
Um, Darnell Hunt, who's the Dean of Social Sciences at UCLA, launched this report in 2014, um, which focuses on race, ethnicity, and gender representation in Hollywood. Well, earlier this year, part one was released, um, which focused on representation in film. And the report found that uh, the percentage of leading roles played by people of color in last year's top 200 films has nearly quadrupled over the last decade, while the percentage of women in leading roles nearly doubled. So given that context, we were curious to understand how does this representation look in television? So now let's go ahead and get started. So this slide includes all debuts or shows that premiered their first season from 2018 through April 22. And the demand which you see here on the X axis that they achieved in the US the year that they were released. And for the purposes of this analysis, we're only going to look at the tent poles or the most in demand shows. And these are roughly the top 3% of shows, um, or those that generated exceptional or outstanding demand in the US the year that they premiered. Furthermore, we're only going to look at scripted debuts. So this will, uh, the analysis will exclude children's or animated series. And again, we're only going to analyze the trends of the most in demand shows or tent poles with outstanding or exceptional demand. And for each of these shows, when looking at the lead or starring talent, we're considering the top five or up to five on screen regular series cast members as listed in the show credits on Wikipedia or IMDb. These were about 675 talent total. And then just a few more definitions before we get going. Uh, when referring to diverse talent, we are referring to series regular actors who are non-white, including Hispanic and Latino talent. Female talent are based on self-identification and middle-aged female talent refers to female identifying talent who were at least 40 years old the year that the series premiered its first season. All right, so now on to what you came for. Here we go. So in this first slide, we see the percentage of temple premieres by year with at least 40% diverse talent. We see that shows with diverse casts are fairly robust with at least half of tent poles each year having two or more of their top five lead talent from diverse backgrounds. And just a quick note, the shows that you see above each of the bars exemplify the most in-demand show for each respective year that meets the criteria that we're talking about. So in this case, these are shows that have at least 40% diverse lead talent. Um, you can see in 2020, that was Lovecraft Count, uh, Country, 2021, Yellow Jackets. So we also can see that diverse representation in tent poles hit a high peak in 2021 where 71% of the most in-demand shows had a diverse cast. Uh, since then, however, we do see a slight decrease. <clears throat> and this year through April, 59% of tentpole premieres have diverse casts. In this slide, we see how representation looks among tentpole premieres coming from linear versus streaming platforms with the blue bar showing us the percentage of temple premieres from linear networks and the purple bar showing us the percentage of temple premieres from streaming platforms. Interestingly enough, when we look at new productions coming from streaming platforms versus linear networks, we see that original linear productions are leading the way in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. There, there are signs, though, that uh, new streaming original series are becoming more diverse in the last couple of years. So what does diversity mean in terms of on-screen representation for the various racial and ethnic groups? Here we see the percentage of temple premieres with at least one lead talent from each of the respective racial and ethnic groups. So what we, hear see, what we see here, I find uh, very interesting. Keep in mind that whites make up about 57% of the US population, 
while people of color or people from diverse backgrounds uh, make up the other 43%. Off the bat, we can see that whites are overrepresented in terms of being cast in lead roles, given that the vast majority of temple premieres have at least one white lead talent. So in addition to having at least one white lead talent, we also see casts of the most in-demand shows have tended to include at least one Black or African-American talent over the last five years. We also see that in 2021, the year where we saw 71% of Temple premieres had at least 40% diverse cast, we see that Latino and Asian representation increased. Um, however, we do see uh, some decreases coming from Black and African American representation compared to 2020. And looking at this year's tentpole premieres, we do see um, a, a downward trend in terms of Latino and Hispanic representation, as well as Asian and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander representation compared to the year before. Now shifting to gender trends in new productions over the last five years. Here we see the percentage of shows, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with at least 40% female lead talent, or at least two out of the top five starring talent that are female. As with diverse representation, we can see that most temple premieres have gender representation. We also see greater gains in terms of gender representation on screen during the pandemic, where nearly all of the most in-demand shows had at least 40% female leads. However, um, as with diverse representation, we see that more recently in the last two years, and especially looking at 2022, we are beginning to see a decrease in gender representation among new productions. Now, shifting again to gender representation among linear and streaming originals. Here we see the percentage of shows with gender representation from linear originals in the light blue line, and, or excuse me, the light blue bars and uh, streaming originals in the coral or orange bars. Overall, we see a similar trend in terms of casting women in starring roles coming from both linear networks and streaming platforms. Um, notably though, in 2020, 100% of the most in-demand new productions coming from streamers had at least 40% of women in starring roles. And this year, they're also leading the way compared to linear productions. Now let's shift to age. Looking at the average age of starring talent, we can see starring talent in new productions are becoming slightly older on average over time. But what does this mean for on-screen equity in terms of the representation of older women? Here we see the percentage of temple premieres with at least one middle-aged woman in a starring role. Now, again, that's at least one out of the top five starring talent. When we combine the age and gender of starring talent, we see that older female talent have steadily made gains from 2019 to 2021 in terms of representation. And we see that nearly half of Temple premieres had at least one woman over 40 among their lead talent in 2021. However, again, we do see that this year's new productions um, are starting to show these gains uh, beginning to erode. Now remember, and let's keep in mind that 2022 Temple premieres go through the end of April. So we still have the better part of the year to see if these trends improve and hopefully they will. And again, um, when we further look at where these gains are coming from, where here we see linear originals shown in the light blue bar and streaming originals in the light purple bar, we can see that streaming original tent poles are a bit more likely to feature women over 40 in starring roles, especially in recent history. 
Um, so for example, if you see here in 2021, more than half of new streaming productions featured at least one woman over 40. Now I'm gonna pause here because I think this is a really interesting point that supports recent press on this topic. Um, which has been highlighting how the streaming wars are creating more opportunities for older talent, excuse me, for older talent and specifically older female talent who previously would not have been considered for lead roles in middle, middle age. <clears throat> so we do see the data um, supporting that point um, that we've been seeing circulating more in, in the press. So now, why do the talent demographics and representation matter? Well, moral judgments aside, I'll leave those for um, another conversation. Our data shows quite simply that this is the right business strategy. You can see in this chart, which um, shows the average demand of tentpole premieres from the last couple of years from leading streaming platforms. So this first, this first chart above that you see here, we can see the average demand of shows by platform that have gender representation or those that have at least 40% of females in lead roles shown in the pink bars and those that don't in the gray bars. <clears throat> so we can see that shows with greater gender representation, remember those are the pink bars, generate greater demand in the US on average than shows that don't. So for example, looking at um, <clears throat> shows on Disney Plus, we can see that shows that have greater gender representation generate roughly 26 times the demand of the average show in the US, while those without gender representation generate just under 17 times the demand on the same platform. Similarly, here we see the demand of tentpole premieres that feature at least one middle-aged woman in the orange bars and those that don't in the gray bars. So again, we can see that for most platforms, shows that feature older women in starring roles tend to generate greater demand in the US on average than shows that don't. So for example, looking at Hulu now, we see that tentpole premieres that have at least one woman over 40 generate about 18 times the demand of the average show in the US compared to just 14 times the demand of shows that don't. So we can see that America's increasingly diverse audiences are demonstrating a preference for content that is representative. Now, we're now gonna show you, <clears throat> excuse me, a few examples of our talent analytics through a deep dive of Hulu's Only Murders in the Building, a show that exemplifies some of the trends in representation that we're seeing in terms of diversity, gender, and age. So this first slide shows us daily TV demand for only murders in the building, 30 days pre-premiere of season one and through the release of the season's 10 episodes. We can see demand climb steadily as a show nears its season one premiere. So that's the first um, green arrow that you see there. We also see another steady increase um, after the release of episode five, which is the second arrow on the chart. <clears throat> now here, we layer on demand for the key talent on top of demand for the show. We can see that ahead of premiere, demand for Selena Gomez, the light green line, <clears throat> excuse me, is exceptionally high. And um, this tells us that she's an incredible opportunity um, for marketing or promotional um, uh, purposes to leverage her fan base and generate excitement for the show ahead of release. However, when we analyze demand for Steve Martin more closely, we can see that his demand spikes around promotion for the show. So here, roughly 16 days um, before the show premiered, he guest starred on The Real Time with Bill Maher, 
And later he did a press circuit around the time of release. And then roughly one week after he guest starred on The Late Show. And you can see that each time his demand spiked, signaling that when he's engaged in prom promotional activity um, about the show, his fan base responds. And this likely contributed to the steady increases in demand that we saw for the show ahead of release and again, and again after episode five, which coincidentally is right after he guest starred on The Late Show. <clears throat> Thus, um, Steve Martin provides another opportunity for Hulu to promote the show. So we've now seen how we can track demand for a title and the talent, but what can we learn about what the audience is saying about the show ahead of release and what can we learn about the sentiment behind those conversations? So in this next analysis, we look at the social conversations about Hulu's murders only in the build, only murders in the building, and drill down to conversations about the show that also mention the talent. We can then examine the share of conversations that are driven by each specific talent in the show to reveal which talent are top of mind for the audience. We can see that Selena Gomez is the most talked about in conjunction with the show and heavily drives conversation about the show pre-release. So this combined with her exceptional demand make her a strong asset to leverage in promotion. However, we also see that after the season premieres, uh, we see that Steve Martin gains traction in conversations that the audience has about the show providing an opportunity to leverage his fan base for engagement as well. But what can we learn about how people are talking about the talent in relation to the show? Does the audience have a positive perception about the talent's roles within the show? So in this next analysis, we examine the sentiment behind the conversations that the audience is having about the show. Using a machine-based algorithm, we are able to detect the sentiment behind conversations and categorize them as either positive, negative, or neutral. What we see here is an opinion index, which takes into account the share of positive to negative comments so that anything above zero reflects a positive sentiment with 100, meaning that 100% of the conversations are positive and anything below a zero indicating a negative sentiment with negative 100, meaning that 100% of the conversations are negative. So as you can see here, in no month did the opinion index dip below zero, which would indicate an overall negative perception about the show. On the contrary, the score of 60 in August, just before the season premiered, indicates an overall positive perception about the show. So what about the audience sentiment about the talent? We can see here that overall, when the audience talks about the talent in relation to the show, they express an even more positive perception about them. And we can further see that Steve Martin in the blue line and Martin Short in the red line drive positive sentiment ahead of the season one release. Now combined with what we learned earlier about Steve Martin's demand spiking with promotion about the show, we can see that um, the audience is very interested about his involvement with the show. And this interest is very positive. Again, demonstrating the value that he brings to the show and the opportunity that Hulu has to capitalize on his goodwill and association with the brand. So this wraps up what I have prepared for you today and I'm now gonna turn it back over to Rebecca. Awesome, thank you, Monica, that was wonderful. Um, we've got a few more minutes until we start our panel conversation. So, um, while we, we, we give it a little bit more time, I wanted to ask you some questions that we actually received from people when they registered for the event. So, um, and, and one from me, actually, <laughs> I'll start it off. The first one is um, just from your perspective, you know, having looked at data 
um, for many different types of shows and for talent uh, for, for our entertainment clients, what was the most surprising part of your analysis? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think what was the most interesting for me, um, I guess I'll say two things. The first being that I found it really interesting that linear networks seem to be leading the way in terms of racial and ethnic representation. Now, when we think about it, I think it makes sense because um, linear networks tend to have a much smaller number of new productions each year. And in the US, they obviously need to cater to a very diverse audience, right? And streaming platforms, on the other hand, have a much larger volume of productions that they're producing each year um, and for a more global audience. So perhaps the focus on racial and ethnic diversity may not be as top of mind, um, or uh, it's possible that because there's just a much larger volume of shows that they're producing, um, that we have room for just a more diverse set of stories that are being told. And um, the ones that the shows that end up breaking through becoming the most in demand um, may just have, you know, fewer uh, diverse representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, point that we've seen, you know, captured and talked about over the years. But before I saw your slide, actually comparing the two streaming with linear networks, it's actually hard to quantify the true results that we've seen, you know, and the changes over time. Um, so that was, that was really interesting to see that. And I, I think that'll be a, a, one of our questions we have for our panelists in a few minutes to kind of talk about what their perception of um, the differences in casting for streaming or, or linear uh, shows. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to hear what they have to say. Um, I will also say, though, that we do see that gap narrowing in the last couple of years. So, um, you know, it's possible that there's a um, renewed focus on, on the issue from streaming platforms. Um, and I did want to say one other thing that I found that was very surprising um, and a little bit disheartening, I guess, is that we are seeing some of those gains in terms of gender, diversity, age, starting to erode in 2022. Um, so I did want to just remind us that, you know, the analysis just considers shows through April. And so it's possible we just haven't, we just haven't seen, you know, the full set of shows that will premiere through the end of the year. Um, and so it will be interesting to kind of pick this back up at the end of the year and see how 2022 fared um, after the year wraps up. Definitely. We, we hopefully we can provide an update on that data uh, you know, by the end of the year or early next year and kind of see how, see how we did uh, for, for the rest of the year. Um, so there was another question that I, I just wanted to ask so that you can sort of address this. because It's a really, um, it's an important part of the discussion on representation. The question from one of our attendees was, how are queer people represented in mainstream television or streaming? And how often are they in leading roles? So I, I know that we didn't cover that here, but I thought maybe you'd have some points to share as to how or wh why not and how we would approach that if we can. Yeah, yeah that's a really good question. Um, and obviously that is a very important part of representation, um, which we do not talk about today. Um, just to give a little bit of context out of the 600 and about 75 talent that we looked at, um, only four identified as non-binary. Um, and in terms of sexual orientation, we did not code for that. Um, I think that it's it's just a little bit, uh, not a little bit, I, it could be a lot more difficult to um, really get at that information because we do rely on publicly available data. And so, um, you know, we would be able to look at anyone who identifies as LGBTQIA, um, but if they don't, then obviously we would be missing uh, some of that in terms of representation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I've got one other question from um, uh, one of our attendees. I'm just curious if, if you already saw this in the data that you looked at. Um, did you see any seasonal trends in ethnic or gender age representation? Yeah, so we didn't look at the at the data in that level of granularity. Um, we looked at the data, you know, on a yearly trend um, because we only looked at the tentpole uh, shows. Um, we just wouldn't have had a robust enough sample to look at it that way. But I think that that's really interesting. Um, and I'm wondering from our panel or our, our audience member who posed that question, um, why we would expect to see seasonality if there's an assumption that there would be. Um, I think that with with linear networks, we do know there's still, you know, the whole fall premiere uh, focus on, on fall premieres. And so perhaps with linear networks, we could expect to see some seasonality. Um, with streamers, I don't know that they follow the same, you know, cadence in terms of release um, throughout the year. So it's, it's interesting. I definitely would um, be interested to look into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, that's all the questions that we have for you. We're going to move into our panel conversation in, in just a minute. Um, there's one more thing that we that we offer to all of our webinar attendees, and I think this is the next slide, Monica. Uh, uh, just so you all know, you can access this ta TV and talent demand and movie demand in Demand 360 Lite. So we always offer a 30% discount for our webinar attendees. So I will drop that in the chat. Um, and you'll you'll you can use that to to get thirty percent off of our entertainment analytics suite. So uh, what you're looking at, there's a couple of screenshots. You're able to get real time information about demand for thousands, tens of thousands of individuals and TV. So the way that Monica was showing us the increasing demand for only murders in the building, um, that's something that you'd be able to see in this product. Also for individual talent and being able to compare them against each other. So I will drop that link in the chat and you'll also get an email after this, um, but let's actually move on. We're ready to have our panel conversation. Um, I know we have, Tiffany is waiting in the wings and let's just see, and John, wonderful. So uh, give me one second. I'm just going to um, pop them up here and have them join as our panelists. So John, let's see here. And Tiffany. Awesome. Oops. Okay, so they should be joining any minute now and they can join. That's great. Hey, John. Hey, hey how are you, Rebecca? I'm good. How are you? Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again, too. How are you? Hi, Monica. Hi, John. It's so nice to see you. And there's and, Tiffany. Hi, hi, Tiffany. Welcome. Hey. Hi. How are you? I like your headshot too, Tiffany. <laughs> That's not even a headshot. My hairdresser took that after she cut my hair and I just took it. I love it's it. a good one. So good. <laughs> Thank so you good. both so much for, for joining us today. I know we have a very um, exciting and interesting conversation to be had. Um, Monica just wrapped up a really insightful conversation about the data behind representation, but you guys are here to give us a perspective uh, from the creative side and, and actually doing the casting and working with talent uh, that we just reported on. So um, let me introduce you to, to our, our audience. Um, I am so excited to introduce John Hoffman, co-creator and showrunner of Only Murders in the Building and Tiffany Little Canfield, the casting director for Only Murders in the Building, and also other productions like In the Heights, This Is Us, and the Sex in the City reboot, and just like that. Lots more too. Um, and I have to say, uh, Only Murders in the Building was a finalist for our Global TV Demand Awards earlier this year, uh, which is how I've spoken to John before. Um, and the second season premieres on Hulu in just a few weeks on June 28th. So lots of exciting things happening there. John, thank you so much for joining us. So happy to talk to you again. I, I was one of my favorite conversations from season one when I was finding my way through all these interviews. I thought that's the one I want to get back to because that was really interesting. You I'm know, so glad. A perspective and a, and, a, and a global perspective in many ways. It's true. That's right. We often look 
at the data for TV and talent on a global perspective. So we were talking about Hollywood. That's what that's what we're using, you know, but really Hollywood is very global these days. So these questions that I'm asking today, um, they can be through global or or a US focus, but as you know, it could be it's uh, different depending on what you're create what platform you're creating for. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a more general question um, about casting and creating content in general for our audience. What are the criteria you use when considering individuals for a project? Tiffany, can you start? Yeah, um, certainly. Um, you know, it's really tricky because we're in an art form that when you're really good at it, it looks really easy, right? Because <laughs> it's <laughs> like just behaving. So, um, you know, I think we look at character first. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, obviously uh, skill set, you know, like, um, you know, uh, training um, ability. We love to read actors, I feel like, on, on Only Murders in the Building and discover people and see, let that sort of um, uh, instruct the process a bit. Um, we learn as we're working on it. And that's also the fun part and, and the discovery part. So I would say, and then I really do think diversity is really important and seeing people who might not be exactly as you expected reading and seeing how that infects the story. And um, so that's, those are the sort of things I, I think about. And mm -hmm. when, when we start to select talent to read for us. Mm -hmm. John, what about you? I, what do you think? I think it's so interesting. And I love that Tiffany is here talking about this because I get to, say, you know, when, you know, in this process, it's a very big partnership for the success of a show. And, and, and to me, you know, knowing uh, Tiffany and her partners, Bernie Telsey and, and Destiny Lilly and Danielle King, uh, these are all incredible, uh, smart people, again, honing right in on character first and, um, and, and expanding the platform of, of who could be that character, uh, you know, within, within a certain framework, but the expansion is what I love. And what is, I really rely on with them in huge ways, and they just are brilliant at, is knowing um, a very expansive core group of actors. Uh, you know, we're, we make our show in New York City, and this is a very, uh, sort of started out of New York company that we work with. And so we are a theatrical show. And so I think, you know, we are very much a stepchild in television of the theater. And I think if there's one place to look for a very multicultural experience and a, an experience that reflects New York City in a huge way and that, it, that ultimately reflects the world because it is a true melting pot. I think that combination with the, with looking at it through the lens of talent, training, and um, expansiveness is, is the part, is the triangle to me of, you know, let's open our minds to, you know, the best person getting the role. And, and you know, I think we try our, our best to sort of reflect New York and to open ourselves up to being surprised. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that. I mean, when, tell us about the, maybe like the ratio of roles that you're casting for where the character has been written for a specific person or, or not. And you have that opportunity to be expansive and to consider somebody unique or up and coming or unknown. Like what, what's the balance there? Just very curious for those of us who just aren't in it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so funny. Um... I think truthfully, we, we do look at characters. So when we look at a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife, um, and then we look at you know, any character across the, across the range. So there are times it's very specific that we're looking to just reflect. I would even almost just say it's, it's, it's not something we're trying to be enlightened about. It's actually reflecting the truth and getting to authenticity within that reflection of the truth. So we very specifically draw our characters a la Theo Demas, uh, you know, and knowing we wanted our character Teddy Demas to have a deaf son. 
Um, and so when you do that, you then become very responsible about, okay, we need a you know, from birth death actor making very specific choices within the structure of casting um, that's led by Tiffany really. Um, and and that, that's hugely helpful for being specific within our specifics of the needs of the script. Now, then again, we've opened it up again to, you know, I don't like to confine ourselves uh, that way and sort of, you know, within marriage, within children, within, um, you know, super fans, mm -hmm. um, we will sort of discover and find this diversity that reflects the city um, without a real plan about that. We have a specific film character, but someone like Ali Stroker, um, who plays Paulette, one of our super fans, um, came along and it was like, fantastic, she's fantastic. And, and there she is, she's, you know, it's, it's the diversity that feels just right, but it's also electric performers and not being confined to some situation where that, that might make it challenging in certain ways. No, it actually makes it really interesting. Um, let's go lean into that, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so in terms of, of casting for season one versus season two, Tiffany, I'm curious, did you have a different approach um, for this show and, and for other shows? And if, what kind of inputs, do you look at any kind of data? What are the, what's the I'll information? Look at data. You yeah, I'll be honest. I don't look at data. In fact, okay. I was watching your, your, you know, your, your, the half hour before this started and just mind blown that someone is tracking like that. I'm so happy to see that. And actually I came in right when we were talking about older women and I was like, this is a big thing. The older women is a real issue. And um, I do think we kind of, John and I'll talk about it. Cause again, we have a lucky thing where we see such great people for each part that, and only one person gets the part. So often we have, a, a situation where we're thinking of this actor we have to remember this actor for something else and stuff like that and especially when it feels like uh, an area where there could be more representation I feel like we have a conversation saying let's earmark this actor um, for to get them in here you know because they were amazing this role didn't go their way but that's the kind of person we want on the show and that's the world we want to reflect in the casting so we kind of see it uh, populating. And I would say that we had some people that we, we liked from season one, you know, that we would like to bring back and, uh, and then just, just continuing in that way. I don't think I had an agenda in my mind. I was really happy with season. I, I felt like our collaboration was really successful and truthful. So I just wanted to kind of keep in that, in that vein, um, keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I love hearing when, people on your side, your mind is blown <laughs> because I think that might be what we talked about, John, when we were first sharing, you know, talking about the data behind the global demand for the show itself. Um, we can get extremely granular in terms of what audiences are engaged with. And often what we see is not, um, it, it, different than what everybody kind of assumes right so it's it's that's kind of why I love seeing Monica's work because we are actually able to really look at it and pull those segments like you were saying Tiffany you know the women um, older women like actually being able to quantify the demand for for shows that feature older women Monica it's it's I think over the last five years right it has actually been higher than shows um, without featuring those women Correct. Yeah, yeah. When we look at the demand of shows on leading streaming platforms for shows that feature just that feature gender representation in general, and then that feature older women as well, we do see um, the trend being that they generate more demand. Like, mm -hmm. I think that there's, you know, an increased appetite from the audience to see just diverse, diverse in like a very broad, you know, sense of the word representation on screen um and we're seeing that mm -hmm. you know you're singing my song because that's like my my sweet spot an, an older woman particularly older woman in new york i'm i can't get enough of it and i will also say that uh for a season two um 
there's a lovely synchronicity. I mean, sadly, it's our victim, but our victims on our show don't stop working in our season two. <laughs> and uh, we, with Bunny Folger at the center of a season two, I will also say as a slight spoiler, um, and I won't say anything more than this, mm -hmm. but the marriage of Bunny Folger with Parrot Analytics for a season oh two. Oh. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> the suspense is killing me. <laughs> I can't wait. You know. <laughs> right? But yeah, no, and I think it's, you know, coming, I worked on Grace and Frankie uh, before this show mm -hmm. and I was amazed. I, you know, they're in their last season now and I was looking at the Netflix numbers on that show in this last season and they are through the roof. There's nothing more encouraging to me. I love, I love, and knowing that, knowing that comes from data that you guys are collecting. I love it. I love knowing that stuff. But so, it can, it can, it, it can just open you up further. It doesn't have to guide the kinds of stories we're telling. It, they don't feel right. You can't obviously do something that's not organic in, in storytelling, I think. But I think, you know, I like anything that breaks down resistances. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, diversity of all kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what this shows is that um, there is an appetite for stories that feature older women in that facet of their life, right? Which I think, I mean, you can speak to this better than I can, but um, there was a resistance to featuring those types of stories before um, that we're seeing now starting to hopefully, you know, uh, turn turn the corner in terms of seeing those stories being represented yeah, yeah. so also this um we kind of briefly chatted about this in the presentation and after in terms of the differences between the demand and the casting for streaming and linear shows so we saw it on the data side and now we would love your perspective on casting for a show that will live on a global streaming platform versus a project that will live on a linear network. And what are the differences? Is there any less pressure when casting for streaming? Because there is a perception that it allows for more niche content. Uh, is that true from your perspective? How, how do you approach those type of projects and do you see a difference there? I Tiffany, can jump. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, I was like I linear, meaning like network broadcast network. Yes, like ABC, exactly. ABC. Okay, I was exactly. like linear. Interesting. Okay. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. um, it's our, for it's example, like this is good. us versus who yes. is only murders in the building. Honestly, I do not. See, I feel like that conversation may happen before I get there in terms of the mm -hmm. kind of show it is in the right from the writing perspective, from the casting perspective. I would say that diversity and inclusion is very important to everyone. Um, I feel very supported by the studio and networks in a way that, um, and networks including streaming um, companies than I have ever felt. Uh, and it, it is, I think more and more. And so I do think that linear um, uh, networks have brands more than, um, you know, so there might be some stuff like you might encourage people to get their hair blown out or, you know what I mean, to wear a certain kind of makeup or an outfit because of the brand of the network to feel, but in terms of the actual person and the artist, I'm, I'm trying to push the, you know, get it as diverse and interesting as possible. There might be a little styling. I feel like, you know, streaming you've got more um edge maybe in terms of less you know like hair and makeup and stuff but that's it <laughs> it's true i mean it's funny you know i when you, we were crafting the show and it you know it, i think our show is built around a building in new york city so there's the world of the building and who would be living in that building and then there's the further expansion into the city and and how many parts of the city do we explore? And we want to be representative of as many in all parts of the city. It's the beauty of doing a television series. You get to start to get expansive. But in some ways, I do think in success, the hope was, and now it feels like, oh, we're bearing out the fruits of that, um, that we continue the thing 
of expanding that New York has always done. Um, and so getting global in that way beyond just, it marries kind of like to what the show is doing in the world. I just got off also um, a huge Zoom with our marketing uh, team at Hulu and the plans that they have for our season two are wildly expansive and global and their plans and everything they're doing. And I was, I'm, it's so stunning to me, the reach that can happen uh, when there is demand and then how to increase that demand, but also how to make the outreach and how to open it up. But then you really do feel like, oh, I'm, when as a storyteller, you're really sitting back and going, I am telling a story for the world here. Um, there's no question that's where it's landing and where it's going. So there's no way for it not also to sort of be a part of the thinking. Uh, again, organically, when you're crafting the story. And yeah. cast. Well, and you have this cast with a wildly global fan base, which doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we, we saw Selena Gomez's demand up there, you know, it's extremely high and extremely global. So I, I, um, I mean, for, for it's, this was also something we chatted about, John, just the, uh, um, the, unique combination of Selena Gomez and Martin Short and Steve Martin. Um, I mean, is, is that the kind of thing, like how did that come about? You know, we, is, it's a surprising thing. Was, was Hulu surprised? Was this something that you worked on together, Tiffany and John? Like what, how did that? We definitely down? worked on it together. Okay. Um, and it was a question that came up very early on because we knew Steve and Marty were a part of the show. And it was all about that third person. And, you know, it's tricky because you clearly what connects is what happened that none of us could foresee, which is all due to those three people and the chemistry that they have together and the pocket of comedy that they found together as a trio. I promise you no one could have foreseen that. But so we took a gamble that the unexpected nature of seeing the three of them on a poster would make someone go, oh, I love, wait, who are they with? What's that about? And then you would go one way or the other. And generationally, it was exciting because you knew Selena was this very modern young woman uh, with an enormous uh, global fan base, but also there she is married to these um, legendary comedians um, who everybody knows and loves. And so there's an expectation about each of them, but how that combination might work became actually uh, something to lean into as part of our interest beyond just, you know, I think that's what's exciting about the kind of conversations we're having around casting and around storytelling and around bringing people together in shows. The more it can intrigue, the more that it feels unexpected, um, I think you have a better shot than something that feels down the pike in traditional terms. Um, and I think that's what, what we're learning more and more and we learned on this process. Um, but as I say, the real, the real surprise and magic of it all happened just because there are three talents that gelled in this way almost immediately to everyone's huge relief and delight. <laughs> I guess it's a little bit of a surprise. You, you, you don't know. The data certainly can't show us that. That's right. That's right. And yeah. I, I yeah. got kind of excited when we first started talking about it because we didn't know, you know, chemistry, you know, what would happen in that sense. But regardless of that, just having someone so different right? Such a different kind of career. Obviously the generation, I felt like that would be adding a lot of fuel for the comedy because there's just a natural disconnect there that's going to happen no matter what. Like if, even if people are just like, you know, showing up and being like, hey, there's still going to be this just real difference between them. And um, the fact that their chemistry is what it is, is the magic, but I really think it would have worked even if for some reason it was just a job for everybody and they weren't a family because I think we love that conflict. We love to see, you know, I'm talking to my kids, what they're interested. I think that the generational changes happen so quickly 
now with the internet, right? Like, you know, I feel like me and John are the same age, right? I remember before the internet. <laughs> yeah, right. I remember when there were three channels of TV plus like one that we didn't really, didn't come in all the way on our TV, you know, like that kind of a thing. And now how quickly it's changed. I think there's so much uh, just riches there to play with comedically. Yeah, and I would also say this about it because beyond the surprise of just the casting and the chemistry and the comedy, there is the particulars of these three performers, which also suit so well to the characters we wrote, but it's genuinely, it's, it's about breaking down that barrier too on the assumptions about two older gentlemen, because we have two older gentlemen who are the youngest spirits mm -hmm. uh, you could imagine. And you feel it the minute they walk on set. And then you have this very modern young woman who walks on set and you feel the old soul quality. Mm -hmm. it's so, true. so it's about subverting, even within that, those expectations about who those characters are. But that again is like, that's the magic of landing these three actors and then going and making that sort of a, a theme of how you work in casting from there on out, constantly subverting expectations the most you can. Yeah. And the chops too, John, don't you think? Because while Selena is young and modern and everything, she's got a very rich and varied career, right? These are real chops. Yeah. So totally right. Totally right. That's the thing. You recognize it because when we have this amazing, unbelievable supporting cast that comes and the magnet draw that are is is being held by these this trio in the show now to incredible talent wanting to be on the show, it really is about um that dance of you feel all of these amazing actors who you've been admiring of walk on the set and you feel their back straighten. I used to watch Jane Fonda on Grace and Frankie before a take. And I thought, God love her. She's 82 years old and she's nervous and she's breathing and they're about to say action and her back goes up and she goes like, and, and you know, this was in season five. And I love it when I see the actors have that kind of energy behind the work but you feel it all around the set of Only Murders because they've seen the interplay. They've seen the chops that these actors have and they want to swing in that landscape with these esteemed people. And, and that's thrilling to watch, especially from someone you think, oh, I've seen the best that they can do. I've seen all they can do. No, not yet. Not yet. They're, they're <laughs> that's, that, there really is a magic. You, you can feel it as, just the, as an audience member. And, yeah. um, you know, we'll be, we'll be here Picking, watching the demand rise for season two, um, and it's a and, good one. I and hope enjoying it. Loves it. Yeah, I can't wait. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations, both of you, on season Thanks. two, and thank you so much. That's time today. Um, we so appreciate your your time and your perspective. It's so important for us to have both the science and the art. And your presence here is what gives us, you know, what, what makes it, um, you know, allows us to share that with our audience and to really um, kind of show the importance of having both of those perspectives. So we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Congrats again on season two. Um, for our, our audience, I'm going to drop the link to um, Demand 360 Light and then also we will be sharing a uh, recording of the presentation and this panel convo in an email later. So uh, thank you again and um, hope everybody has a wonderful day, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Rebecca. Thank so you. sweet to talk to you guys. Bye, Monica. Bye, Tim. Bye. Bye. Bye, John. Bye.